Hello and welcome to the fourth in our series of asynchronous virtual roundtables on reopening our cities with COVID-19. I'm Hani Mamasani, I'm director of the Northwestern University Transportation Center, and I'll be your moderator. An asynchronous virtual roundtable is one where the interviews have been conducted at different times and integrated into a single roundtable. Uh, this will be followed by live Q&A. Um, and to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom. Cities lie at the core of social, economic, and cultural activity and are the embodiment of human civilization. Public transportation plays a vital role in urban mobility, and several forms of shared mobility and micromobility have come to play an increasingly important role for moving people around in cities. Today, our focus is on the role of shared mobility and micromobility in reopening our cities. And to address this topic, we have an outstanding lineup of experts and industry veterans to um, help us again address this topic. Uh, first off, we'll have uh, Sharon Fagan, who is the founder and executive director of the Shared Use Mobility Center. Um, next, uh, we'll have Shin Pei Tse, who is the uh, director of uh, policy, cities, and transportation at Uber. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, Dr. Susan Shaheen, who is Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley and Director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at Berkeley. With this, we will start with uh, Sharon Fagan. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sharon, uh, you're the founder and executive director of the Shared Use Mobility Center, uh, SUMC, a nonprofit public interest organization uh, that works to address the environmental impact, accessibility, and cost of transportation by connecting public private sectors, uh, building knowledge, and developing solutions that achieve shared mobility for all. Prior to your tenure at uh, the, the, the center, uh, you were CEO of IGO Car Sharing, the nonprofit organization that started car sharing in the Chicago region. And before that, you were director of research and development at the Center for Neighborhood Technology, uh, also here in Chicago. Uh, so you've, you've really been at the forefront of this uh, shared mobility uh, movement in, in many ways. Uh, of course, if you look at the impact of COVID, you take the March through May period, you know, that sort of lockdown period and so on, social, social economic activities dramatically changed during this, this period in most cities around the world. TNCs, just like, like public transit, experience a significant drop in ridership. And in fact, there's been a concern about anything that is shared, right, um, overall, including shared mobility. So your center uh, and yourself, you've been at the, at the forefront of the shared mobility movement. How would you characterize the impact of COVID-19 on anything shared, especially TNCs? And has the crisis set the clock back in terms of the growth and maturity of these services? Or do you see this crisis consolidating and perhaps reaffirming their role as integral to the urban mobility landscape? Yeah. Well, those, those are really good questions, and I think it's a little of both, you know. I think there's a lot of opportunity, actually, for the, um, the sector to mature and to really find the modes that add a lot of value and expand them. At the same time, you're right, you know, there's certainly been a fear of shared anything, and, um, and some of that's for good reason. Um, the way the center looks at shared mobility, we put public transit right at the center mm -hmm. and all of the shared modes kind of around it. And we really see an integrated system that uh, provides a lot of choices and opportunities for people. So, um, so it, it's very holistic. Um, what we've seen specifically in the shared modes is that some of them have really risen to the occasion. So people have had a lot of interest in bike sharing, for example, and that's taken off um, in a lot of places. Um, the scooter sharing has as well. Um, so, and what we've seen is not just sharing of those modes, but actually people purchasing them and adding them, you know, to their to their vehicle choices. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's happened. We've seen, of course, transit 
and the TNCs, um, you know, sharp reductions in use. Now, part of that, though, has been, especially with the TNCs, the use cases, uh, you know, from a study we did back in 2016, and this actually hasn't changed that dramatically since then. The number one uh, uses of TNCs were for going to the airport, going out at night, you know, for entertainment, and then sort of an additional uh, way to get to work. So all of those things and reasons have dropped. So, you know, you have to expect that um, usage of that mode would also drop with that. Now on transit, we've seen it kind of hold tight with the essential workers and people who actually have to get to work uh, and in the Chicago area, you know, I know you've, you've talked with uh, Dorval Carter, um, but the, um, you know, the use on the south side and the west side of Chicago has been, has kind of held to a much higher extent during this crisis. Correct. And so I think with the TNCs, um, there are certain use cases where people also are um, taking advantage of that mode. I would say the shared TNC model, which was something that they were all working on pre-COVID, has really dropped out completely. Um, and there has been uh, more use of TNCs with transit as a supplement for it to, to provide, you know, on routes that are very small now, it, uh, bringing in some TNCs to serve uh, people, you know, and we've seen that going on as well. Yeah. So TNC services like Uber and Lyft and so on, they're essentially double-sided market. It's a market for drivers, right? And a market yeah. for riders that the platform is matching. Uh, my sense is that there is a sort of more of a fear factor among riders than among drivers who kind of need to, I guess, you know, earn an income in some cases. But do you, do you have any sense of that? Have you looked at this? Uh, are there any data that you're aware of about the concerns that drivers might have about sort of driving? Yeah. Well, I think you're right. The fear factor uh, has shown up more on the, um, the rider side, although I think that the drivers have done a lot of advocating for safety measures. And so, you know, having um, like a plexiglass uh, divider um, and other other cleaning materials and all of that has been, um, uh, you know, really strong call for that from the from the drivers. So I think the drivers are concerned, but as you said, it's their livelihood. And I expect, although I don't have any data on this, because there's so much unemployment, there's probably a growing driver pool, if anything for people, you know, um, trying to figure out how to earn an income in this time. Yeah. So on the, I guess a, a lot of the, you know, as we look at reopening, I guess, uh, there is a process of rebuilding confidence. And uh, yeah. we did have the opportunity to discuss it with the uh, transit, uh, you know, um, Chicago Transit Authority with Dor Dor Dorval and, and others around the country. Uh, so there, you know, there are many steps that they're taking in that reg regard, as are the TNCs, in fact, also in terms of, you know, cleaning, masks, etc. cetera. Um, where would you say we are on the public confidence scale at this point uh, today uh, in terms of, you know, using, say, individual rides with an Uber, X, or Lyft, or even taxis versus, say, public transit, you know, where zero may be total fear and 100 being pre-COVID. And one, just anecdotally, I tend to find that it's very bimodal. Okay? There are people who absolutely won't go anywhere. And then there are people who are fear, okay, well, we can, we can do this, we can do that. So what, what is your take on this? Yeah, well, I think that um, uh, on the transit side, there's this essential aspect that yes. where people are really dependent mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's as true with the TNCs. So there's a little more discretion of when you're gonna use it. 
Um, but they're kind of going hand in hand. I think the TNCs in some ways have done a better job on the marketing themselves. And I think this has been a problem on public transit. There was this early information of, you know, don't ride transit. And um, so that only enhanced the fear factor. Um, and the TNCs, along with the airlines, have been promoting themselves <laughs> and, the, and the various safety measures they're taking. And somehow, because you know, it's only you and the driver, um, maybe the fear factor is a little less. Mm -hmm. uh, but but um, you know, and there's always been a concern about cleanliness, I think, in public transit. So. Um, so that overrides it too. It's interesting because I had exactly the same intuition, I guess, as you, as you know, as as, as you do. Uh, but when I when I spoke to our uh, friends at Uber, their view is actually that transit has an edge because it's you know they, it's a bigger vehicle, yeah. uh, in, in a sense, and so distancing is is possibly uh, you know easier uh, on there. And I had thought like you, well, I'm only dealing with one person. I don't have many other people that 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 are, you know that are going to be on that same vehicle. But I, I guess so. Uh, um, you know, it, it, it you could argue it both both ways. It's, it's interesting. Right. Yeah. I, I think the one thing you know it like putting up the plexiglass separation, yes. it really um, brings, the TNCs have always been um, in many ways just an innovative taxi cab. Yeah. And to me, that's like, mm -hmm. now they fully cross into that mode, um, oh, yeah. you know, so, having that kind of separation, exactly. which is fine. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a, you know, an important role for them in that service, but so, that really is, um, you know, how it works. Mm -hmm. So are you aware of any sort of centers or, or research organizations or companies that actually that are uh, doing uh, consumer confidence tracking for ride hailing and other shared mobility services? You know, I've seen, I saw one chart that um, I think it was from McKinsey that they put together that was uh, tracking consumer confidence, and it was very low, but it was from um, maybe mid-May, and it was something like 10% <laughs> um, on the TNCs. So I haven't seen other you know, data on that. Um, you know, what I've seen more is, as I was mentioning, was the growth of all these other modes. And of course, with Uber, we've seen the growth of the delivery services. Exactly. You know, that's been, exactly. you know, where clearly the demand was there and they pushed it as far as they can. Exactly. And that's actually my, my next question. Do, do you see much substitution, I guess, between the driver pools of ride hailing and those doing deliveries? Um, I think uh, I'm sure that the drivers have moved over to doing delivery because there's demand and they're looking for an income. Um, I think it's it's interesting just thinking sort of into the future that a model that includes delivery and consumers in the same vehicle, which has happened to some extent in the past, but I think that that model could be developed further. Um, I also think on delivery, one of the more interesting things is the use of transit for delivery as well. So we've seen um, some agencies, uh, Austin, Texas, Denver, Colorado, some other places where they've actually been using particularly the paratransit services mm -hmm. to do grocery deliveries and they're getting it uh, paid for, they're considered valid rides um, through their FTA funding. Yeah. And, you know, so instead of people having to go out and encounter, and especially people who have accessibility problems right. anyway, uh, to get your groceries brought to you is, is pretty great. And so I think that um, that's also a model that could go forward and has like inklings of new business model revenue streams potentially if 
if uh, some of transit could get involved more fully in, in delivery. So looking ahead, I guess, um, you know, sort of maybe perhaps beyond the uh, immediate uh, crisis, though, I guess my first question is still very much inspired by the current crisis. You were one of the pioneers of shared fleet services. You founded iGo, um, kind of as a competitor to Zipcars, I would say. Uh, with well, we were first in the market we're... in Chicago. So Zipcar came after we were already operating for four years. So just wow, I didn't just I didn't realize there was that much of a, of a timeline. Yeah, we started in two thousand two, yeah. and they uh -huh. came in two thousand six. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> so, so with people still skittish about riding with others, do yeah. you see a resurgence of interest and demand for the iGo, Zipcar type services? Well, you know, that's very interesting because I, of course, you know, have always followed everything with car sharing. And, you know, with the uh, evolution of what would Lyft and Uber uh, serving a lot of the rides, I think there was a real drop off in car sharing use, and uh, and then we had the the proliferation of the one way services around the country, mm -hmm. and then a lot of those companies pulled out of the North American market, uh, continued in Europe, but stopped here, and so uh, they're very small nonprofits. One of the things that has continued is more small serving disadvantaged communities, really adding mobility uh, access to a vehicle uh, in different communities where access to a vehicle is not um, a regular thing. Mm -hmm. So we've seen those programs proliferate around the country, but small, very specific. And then at the same time, car sharing go down in use. But, um, but some of the new models of car sharing have also included providing the vehicles for the Lyft Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. So they've taken on this dual role, not just providing a car for the individual, but also you know, for the driver. And, um, but COVID time, we have seen um, some data and some activity to indicate that there is a new uh, resurgence of interest in car sharing in denser markets where people were using Uber and Lyft and now are more comfortable with the idea that they would be in a vehicle by themselves. It, it, you know, it mostly relates to the, the cleaning and I think it also um, ties in with uh, parking. And, and right now that's pretty easy. So people are, are willing to do that. And it just seems like a safer model. The other part of car sharing that's also um, growing is electric car sharing. Right. And right. so as electric vehicles, um, I continue to be introduced and I think electrification is going to become a bigger part of the marketplace overall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, electric car sharing cars has been a way that a lot of the industry has seen to, to introduce those vehicles to people. Mm -hmm. So Sharon, with, with people living more local, Mm -hmm. neighborhood oriented lives have micro mobility alternatives like bike sharing e-scooters become more significant uh and really where do you see the future for micro mobility are we past the novelty of e-scooters or will this really become a significant sort of lasting form of urban mobility yeah well i think how well it works depends on what we do with land use and infrastructure because um, I think we have that potential right now to really grow the bike sharing, the scooter sharing, micro mobility options. There's a lot of interest in it, you know, from a, I mean, the safety side, the cleaning safety side of things, you're on it by yourself. Uh, it's very attractive, obviously in markets where, um, you know, like Chicago, where it's really cold in the middle of winter, um, you know, that's more challenging. 
but certainly in warmer climates, um, it's good all year round. And, you know, um, I think the e-bikes have changed the nature of uh, bike sharing so that it appeals to a broader audience as well. Um, but you have to create the space for people to safely do all these things if you're going to get, you know, a wide variety of people involved in it. But right now is the moment. I mean, that we there is the potential to really build that out, I think. So are you seeing any innovation on the horizon in terms of shared mobility and micromobility uh, that may have been accelerated or possibly slowed down by the health crisis? I mean, crises also create opportunity in, you know, in many ways. What, can, can you comment on that? Are you seeing anything out there that we should be aware of? Um, well, one thing on the, this is actually on the delivery side, uh, to some extent, um, cargo and the bike share part. <laughs> so, so cargo bikes and just different kinds of bikes. Um, I think there's been a lot of innovation and a lot of work on that. And in some cities, not so much in Chicago, uh, it's really become a much bigger, uh, bigger thing. And UPS is delivering everything by, you know, but not maybe not everything, but a lot by bike in Seattle and New York City, and um, and all of those kinds of innovations go hand in hand with mobility hubs. And mobility hubs is something like I, I've been talking about for years, you know, back at the Center for Neighborhood Technology, we were always like, you know, the hub. And, and of course, this is a idea that came from Europe. Um, and now we're starting to see this idea actually get built out. Mm -hmm. And a hub is really a place you can have storage lockers there. You can have all these different modes. People can learn about those modes um, together. It's a play. It's the physical integration of the, the app. Um, kind of an old ra rail station. Yeah, right. It, 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 I know. In a way, it's a very old idea, but it's not just one train line. Mm -hmm. it, it requires those partnerships right. and um, and thinking about how you piece it all together. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, those are innovations that are happening. I think also in the vehicle types, like um, three wheels, mm -hmm. you know, somehow having enclosed vehicles, the Vespa type uh, sharing is, some of that was happening pre-COVID. I think some of that will continue. I mean, at the same time, you know, there has been a lot of consolidation and you can't have, um, the business model is challenging for everyone, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so having lots of different companies is even more challenging. So you don't see any big disruptors on the horizon? Uh, to totally <laughs> take a, just a whole new mode? Like the next new Uber or something like that? Um, yeah, it could happen. I, I mean, I think in the... Um, I think the bikes, like, as I think we're going to continue to make it easier for people to bike, <laughs> and there's some some version of that mm -hmm. that that could be a disruptor. I'm waiting for the bubble, uh, one person, um, I guess, mobility tool. I think that would. Uh... Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. You know, there was like a long time ago, like kind of the idea of these. I remember that. Yeah. Pods, mm -hmm. and then you put them all together on one track, mm -hmm. and they. Yeah. go and then they disperse out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you, when you presented the scope of your center, you said that public transit is really at the sort of at the core, at the center of it. Yeah. Um, would, are TNCs and conventional public transit friends or foes? Uh, you know, in some countries, especially in Europe, public agencies have put themselves clearly as the mobility as a service providers. But in the US, it's really more the TNCs that said, you know, we're the multimodal app, 
you know, we're the mobility as a service platforms here. Uh, you know, they've, and then they've added transit and in some cases worked out payment arrangements and things like that. What's your take on the current situation and how do you see it evolving? Um, well, I think, um, I think that there is the opportunity for uh, them to work together. I think that the public sector is very critical in setting the rules and making sure that it happens in the public interest. And that doesn't mean that you can't have a private company, and you probably will have a vendor who is providing the integration services. But you know the, the challenge when you have someone like Uber doing the integration is is Lyft going to be on the platform? You know, is uh, you know, are they, it that becomes just um, their companies, and so that's fine. They can have that, but if you, I think, for the general public and really the growth of entrepreneurs and new ideas, you need something that is um, managed by the public sector in the sense of the interest. So, so we're kind of favoring, you know, some hybrid model there. Mm -hmm. And I do think that COVID, um, what it has done is it's brought together a lot of public and private partners. So I think on the public side, we have trouble uh, cooperating too. You know, we have these different agencies and they're not always so integrated. And then, uh, then you bring in the private players, and um, you know there are other challenges. And you know there, have, of course, been all these challenges around data sharing and other things. But I actually think this crisis has brought a lot of folks together. So you have a lot of um, of these task forces happening. I'm part of one in Denver that's um, looking at future mobility, and it's brought together representatives from all over the private sector as well as the public sector and everybody's working together to kind of solve some real mm -hmm. problems yeah i guess the competition becomes carmax <laughs> yeah <laughs> Right. Oh, great. So, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, Sharon, it's been very informative, and I thank you for your time. Do you have any final thoughts for us, and for our audience? Um, I think, you know, right now it's really hard to um, see the path <laughs> in some ways, but I think we just need to, to look at this moment as also um, the disruption of it is a time for a little disruption in how we're looking at public transit, how we're looking at, especially, I'm very interested in the business models and the financing. And I think there's some new ways to do that and bring uh, companies together. And, you know, it, I think we can, we can do it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Uh, again, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Shinpei, you're Director of Policy, Cities, and Transportation at Uber. Uh, in your current role, you lead a team of issues experts uh, that contribute to creating a sustainable, multimodal urban future. Uh, previously, you were Executive Director of the Gale Institute, uh, whose mission is to make public life a driver of policy, design, and governance. Prior to that, you were Deputy Executive Director of Transit Center, a national foundation focused on improving urban transportation and urban Urban mobility. So you have a very varied background, I guess, in urban mobility uh, and in you know both public and and and, and private side. So um, what we want to talk about today is how this, um, I guess, the COVID crisis has impacted urban mobility. Uh, of course, we know that uh, social and economic activities have dramatically changed during this shelter-in-place lockdown in most cities around the world. Uh, TNCs, just like public transit, experienced significant drop in ridership during that period. And um, now that we're in various stages of relaxing restrictions, uh, you know, overall mobility 
quality indicators, say from cell phone data, have tended to bounce back significantly. But when you know we still notice there's apprehension towards anything that is shared uh, that involves close interaction, you know, with strangers, uh, and of course public transit has really sort of taken you know the, the the brunt of that. But to some extent, I think TNCs have also uh, seen that apprehension. Uh, but you know, over the past few years, TNCs have become integral to urban mobility. Uh, sometimes complementing, other times competing with public transit and the privately owned car. So, uh, of course, TNCs are again expected to play a significant role in public mobility under most scenarios of free opening, etc. But I want to start um, by talking about public health uh, initially. Uh, what particular health-related health challenges did ride hail ride share services encounter? during the shelter in place period. I'm talking sort of the March to May period. And what kind of special measures have been put in place to maintain the health of customers and drivers? Sure, thanks. Um, and it's really great to be here. Um, well, when, when COVID was first detected, I think there was, you know, we were um, really careful to um, better understand what was going on. There was a lot of uncertainty um, as it became clear that it was highly contagious, one of the first things we did was actually ask people not to take rides. Um, we we launched a big um, campaign asking riders to stay home. Shared mobility is really hard in COVID, you know, during a COVID period because sharing, um, you know, it make, sharing is is basically compromised. Right. Um, so we were very very concerned about, you know people on the platform at all. Um, we also recognized that there were people that needed to get to work. And um, there were frontline workers and essential workers that were taking care of um, people who had come down with the virus or were allowing people to shelter in place. Mm -hmm. And so we pivoted to um, providing free rides to frontline workers, to essential workers. We also realized there are people that needed meals, um, you know, because of our Uber Eats business. Um, we were very, you know, we're uh, aware of mm -hmm. the food and meal side of things. And, um, you know, seniors needing to shelter in place, school kids who usually get their hot meal at school, we were, we started to deliver meals to people as well. And that was our, that was happening during our immediate response. Mm -hmm. You know, while riders were staying at home, drivers still needed to work. So we did scramble to try to procure enough safety equipment for the drivers in that time. But I think it's um, it's been reported that, you know, rides have been down significantly as a result of COVID. So um, it was a, a small group of people. So um, economists think of Uber services as double-sided markets. You know, it's a market for drivers on one hand, and it's a market for riders that the platform is then matching. Where would you say the apprehension factor has been greater? Is it among riders or among drivers? Well, I think with riders, it's one of those situations where many of them may have another option, or if they don't, there's, there's transit, for example. Um, and what we could do there was just ask people not to ride. Um, we've since mandated masks for everyone, um, but at the beginning it was, you know, asking people to stay home as much as they could. On the driver's side, maybe there aren't, you know, there are drivers who are relying on um, driving as um, an income source and that, you know, that became very, um, you know, needed um, as businesses were shutting down, people are getting furloughed. Um, maybe maybe business is closing um, completely. And so there we were, I think there's perhaps a little bit more apprehension there because there wasn't much choice. Um, we weren't encouraging drivers necessarily, but if they wanted to be, um, if they wanted to be driving, we were trying our best to get them some safety equipment. Mm -hmm. So of course we were hoping that by now we wouldn't even be talking about this, but of course, we're still very much dealing with the, uh, uh, you know, with the disease, with the pandemic. Uh, so, but if you look at the current situation, sort of June, July period, on the public confidence scale, where would you say we are today in terms of using, you know, whether it be individual rides with UberX, Lyft, or even taxis versus, say, public transit? If you were to kind of uh, put a number between zero or, you know, zero is total fear and 100, which is what we had pre-COVID, where, where would you say we are? Just in terms of public confidence, not in terms of ridership, just public confidence. 
Yeah, um, I actually think that um, there's greater public confidence over, over public transit. The vehicles are larger. There's more social distancing possible. Um, and ride hail trends in terms of confidence tend to trend consistent with public transit. Mm -hmm. um, I think ride hail is slightly less desirable right now than transit um, because it's a smaller vehicle. It's um, um, you know, it's uh, somewhat, you know, a, a stranger, for example. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I think I, th I was reading a survey um, done by IBM in April where it said that, you know, you know, as many as 50% of people are not going to be taking ride hail in the foreseeable future and 20% to 40% would not take public transit. So you can see that trend line um, where it's, it's not total fear, but there's just, you know, some um, some okay. apprehension. Yeah, yeah. So, well, how much tracking of consumer sentiment uh, has your company conducted? Uh, of course, you know the platform gives direct access to users, giving them the opportunity to rate the quality of service and so on. But have you leveraged the app, say, and and that connection to the direct connection to the user to learn more about sentiment, about concerns, about intentions, and so on? At least with a subset, perhaps, of users. We don't track sentiment through the app per se. Mm -hmm. What we were trying to do, it's a, you know, it's a small interface, right? So what we try to do there is um, really be strong on our safety messaging mm -hmm. um, and, and have people nudge them towards safe behavior. We, do, we have been tracking sentiment outside of that through focus groups um, and try to stay very close to how people are feeling about um, you know, mobility or movement around the city. And, and frankly, they, sh they shouldn't be moving very much right now still in, in the U.S. anyway, and other regions, yes. um, it's a different story. But in the U.S., it's, um, you know, we don't want people to be moving that much. So I'm guess actually, as a, you know, uh, goes into my next question, which is that various places around the world, in Asia and Europe, have started reopening ahead of the U.S. as the disease spread there, you know, earlier. Have you been following trends there and maybe learning from those experiences, whether from Uber International Operations or possibly other companies like Didi in China, for instance? Uh, and what can you share with us in terms of emerging trends and lessons learned elsewhere? Yeah, we were, um, as an international company, it's really um, fortunate that we were able to learn from other regions early. Mm -hmm. Our team in the Asia Pacific region flagged COVID before it was even on the radar in the US. Um, it, it, you know, as soon as it emerged in China, we had responses from our teams in Australia, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Korea, Japan, they they like they had a lot of protocol. Like the governments there had protocol that kicked you know that kicked in. Part of that is because Asia dealt with the SARS pandemic um, nearly you know is it more than oh, uh, in the early 90s I believe, and that was a huge learning experience for them. And I think in particular, um, you know, what's interesting was they have a very they have a very different culture and um, and very different relationship with government. So when governments mandate mask wearing, people tend to do it. They actually never had to shut down completely. Mm -hmm. But I think Taiwan in particular had provided some interesting um, lessons that other places could learn from because they never shut down completely. Gotcha. Transit was down maybe 80%. Um, but the government did a lot to make sure that they were safe. For example, they were among the first to quarantine visitors from outside, the, from international visitors were immediately quarantined by the government. The government would pick them up from the airport take them to a hotel, give them a care package with food, coupons, you know, mm -hmm. film streaming, game, <laughs> games, whatever, and be like, you need to, you need to stay in the hotel for 14 days and you need to call this number every day to let us know where you are. And, um, and so there was a lot of tracking, obviously very different privacy, um, um, and privacy laws in those areas as well. So it's again, very different than the US. But Australia is another good example where, you know, things never completely shut down. There's a lot of trust. There's a lot of communication from the government um, and people kind of, you know, moved into formation. Um, so I think, you know, what's interesting to learn from those places is obviously, you know, what you can do when you, when the government has a very strong response, mm -hmm. when there's a lot, there's very strong cooperation and business never really, you know, had to make the big um, decisions that we had to make. And the economies are not in as dire straits as um, they are in the U.S. 
course, it's easier when you're a small island as well, of course, that, that helps. Well, I think that's why Australia has a similar uh, reaction. Taiwan in particular, yeah, I think has benefited. Yeah, 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 but I think that's why Australia is another um, option. But Taiwan, it is a small island, but in, on the other hand, they, they do not have participation in the WHO. So they do not have international support in the same way. And, and still, nonetheless, we're able to come out of it um, in a strong way. That's right. That's right. Um, so going back to the, the sort of the driver um, issue, the driver pool, have, have most pre-COVID drivers sort of remained in the pool? Or have you seen attrition? Um, I would assume there's been some attrition because there are fewer rides to be, to, to be given. Um, or are you actually seeing more drivers seeking rides because of people losing jobs in the service sector? I don't know. Um, we're not seeing undersupply of mm -hmm. drivers. I don't know why exactly, but we're not seeing that. Um, and I also think that, you know, just going back to the previous question about um, early response, mm -hmm. in the immediate recovery weeks, and especially in China, you're seeing an uptick in private car driving and in private car purchases and new car purchases. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're starting to see that even in the US where many cities are at um, levels of driving that are above um, pre-COVID yes. or close to or above pre-COVID. And I think that's probably, um, it, it's an interesting indicator, right? But driver pool has largely remained the same. Okay, so um, you mentioned Uber Eats earlier. Um, of course, Uber Eats, along with most e-delivery services, has reported significant increases in orders, not surprisingly, with so many people staying home. Have those drivers tended to, to be the same ones that otherwise would have been giving Uber X rides, or is that a different driver, driver pool? Um, I don't have the exact figures here. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that drivers, they can choose. Um, I don't think there's a lot of cross okay. um, dispatching though, because mm -hmm. drivers tend to like one or the other. Exactly. Okay. So um, looking ahead, um, kind of beyond necessarily the current uh, crisis, um, where is Uber with respect to micromobility alternatives, uh, e-scooters, bike share, and so on? And of course, Uber had investments in all of these different areas. With people living perhaps more local neighborhood-oriented lives, have these mobility alternatives assumed greater significance? And will we continue to see this going forward? I absolutely think so. Um, we're very bullish on micromobility. Uh, we did sell sell jump to Lime, but that meant that we have an ownership that we have an ownership stake in Lime. Mm -hmm. And we think that, you know, we we think that actually having these strategic partnerships on our platform means that we can offer micromobility to more users in more cities around the world um, than if we could have done just operating micromobility on our own. And I think what's been interesting, um, if you look at the maps that some of the micromobility operators are putting out, like I think Lime put out some interesting maps of, um, you know, during COVID um, uh, maps. If you look at the ones before, they were very, their trips are very concentrated in like, let's say central business districts. Yeah. If you look at them during COVID, they're very concentrated on neighborhood centers. And so mm -hmm. there's an animization of travel um, that's more distributed um, but still a high demand, um, which I think is really interesting. And, you know, if, if there's any time to try to create 15 minute cities, I think this is it. Okay, so um, Uber has made great strides in terms of turning its platform into a multimodal mobility as a service platform. Um, yet in many cities, um, existing public transit agencies view themselves as the mass provider, you know, the mobility as a service provider, particularly in Europe, actually, uh, a little less so in the, in the US. How do you see this competition complementarity between TNCs and public transit evolving from here? Has the crisis accelerated or slowed pre-COVID trends in that respect? Um, well, we always believe that TNCs are complementary. Um, in fact, we, you know, we, TNCs do well and do the best in cities that have very robust transit systems. So for example, one of our most successful markets would be New York City because there's a very successful, you know, there's a very robust 
transit system there between the subways, mm -hmm. the buses, and um, in even bike share, which there I think operates very much like a transit, um, a public transit system. Mm -hmm. um, we're a very small piece of their overall pie. And if even 10% of the subway, you know, right now during COVID, it's an interesting experiment, right? If even if 10% of the subway riders um, were to drive cars, you would get a 500,000 increase of cars flooding the, yeah. st you know, streets of New York. And that's something that we want, you know, we do not want to see happen. We want transit to come back and believe that we have a role to play um, in helping transit come back. Um, by that, I mean that, you know, maybe we can help people uh, avoid buying a second car or buying the first car by filling in um, for trips that um, maybe transit can't serve all the time. We do that, um, you know, with, for example, um, in Miami, we're doing that right now to provide late night service for essential workers where there's low volume mm -hmm. um, late at night, but still um, people who are, you know, ending their shift and need to get home. Um, we're also working with transit agencies on journey planning, on integrated ticketing. We have integrated ticketing in um, Denver and in Las Vegas, and you'll see more to come. And we're actually also recently um, using our software, have a contract with Marin County um, Transit Agency to use our software to dispatch their vehicles with their workers. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different ways that we can complement transit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, in terms of whether the, you know, I think the Marin County one is an interesting inflection point, right? Because it's the transit agency using our technology to power their system. And on the user side, we also do this in um, Dallas, for example, our Uber is embedded in the Dart app. Mm -hmm. Uber is embedded in the um, SNCF app in outside Paris, around Paris. Right. So we have those, um, you know, we, we, there's a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, we also provide paratransit service um, and wheelchair accessible vehicles. Um, and other, in, in, in Olin Paratransit includes wheelchair accessible vehicles as well as, as you know, assist type of rides. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can be complementary. Um, as the crisis has accelerated, obviously transit agencies are really facing some difficult decisions with revenue shortfalls, right. falls in ridership. Um, and I would say that um, it's, you know, I would, I think our riders are, are, transit riders and our, our shared competitor is the private car. So we want to remain very much um, working together to, to make sure that people don't feel like they have to take on the, the cost of ownership of a car. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think there's lots of different ways that we could do that. Because, yeah, uh, you know, there, there had been several communities, at least pre-COVID, where uh, some of the sort of suburban feeder services and so on were pretty much left to TNCs to handle or in, in some um, co cooperative um, fashion. And, um, and I believe there may have been a few cities where, um, where transit service has sort of almost shut down completely or uh, had been reduced significantly where rather than kind of putting back their buses, you know, out on the streets, they're kind of relying a little more on some of the TNCs to, uh, to provide some of these essential rides to essential workers and essential services. I'm just, again, wondering how much of that sort of uh, discussion is, is ongoing during this period, or, or as you said, transit agencies are so focused right now on trying to, uh, you know, on a sort of a survival mission almost, uh, how, uh, uh, to, to sort of be making those kind of arrangements. Yeah, maybe I wasn't being clear, but I think a lot of those services that you just mentioned are things that we're trying, you know, that we have other mm -hmm. um, created partnerships yeah. with, Correct. or in process. We recently acquired Route Match, which gives us, you know, that they, they serve um, 500 transit agencies with their on-demand technology. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's a lot of variety in the ways that we can help transit agencies. And I expect that to scale significantly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Shinpei. Uh, I wonder if you have any final thoughts for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a few things I thought would be good to um, 
land on, you know, I think with the early responses to the pandemic and the increased profile in racial equity globally, not just in the US, cities have shown that they can do things really quickly and differently. And we hope that they continue in this vein in recovery, think rec creatively about transportation solutions, how on-demand shared electric transportation can complement the services they have and even expand existing access for people. Um, I, we really believe this is more important now than ever before. And we also think that this is a time when, you know, many of the special interest groups around transportation can come together and solve the enormous challenges ahead together with cities. You know, electrification, public transit, bike and ped, or organizations tend to stay in their lane or even fight with each other about the most sustainable path forward. Um, we think this is a time that we all need to come together um, and figure this out. So um, we need to work together moving forward and, um, you know, curious to hear about other people's ideas and how we can do this best. Thank you very much. Shimpei, appreciate your time today and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, all right, Susan, you're a professor uh, in civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley, and you're director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center. Uh, that's part of the Institute for Transportation Studies at Berkeley. Um, you're clearly one of the pioneers who uh, were very early to recognize the potential for shared mobility and study it in depth in terms of adoption, policy, business models, and so on. And so I'm delighted uh, that you could be with us today so we can get your take on how um, sort of COVID-19 has been impacting um, the TNCs, micromobility, and so on. And of course, you know, we all know that social economic activities have dramatically changed during this period, uh, talking March to May, uh, in most cities around the world. And TNCs, just like public transit, experience significant drop in ridership. Uh, and in fact, our friends at Uber you know, pretty much told people do not ride in the, at the, in the beginning. Uh, so um, with cities and states in various stages of relaxing restrictions, you know, one step forward, one step back, I guess, um, mobility appears to have bounced back overall. You know, you look at cell phone tracking data and so on, but there's clearly apprehension towards anything shared you know, that involves close interaction with strangers. So you've been a keen observer of shared mobility and more generally of the shared economy. How would you characterize the impact of COVID-19 on anything shared, especially TNCs? Has the crisis set the clock back in terms of the growth and maturity of these services? Because really for a while, it seemed like the sharing economy couldn't be stopped really? Um, or do you see this crisis maybe consolidating and reaffirming their role as integral to the urban mobility landscape? Mm -hmm. Well, first, honey, I want to tell you, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm really honored to be one of your guests and uh, have just been a huge fan of your work for my entire career. So anyway, I wanted to just start by saying that. So in terms of shared mobility and all things shared, including public transit, yeah, there has been a traumatic effect. And statistics that, that I look at, and I'm sure you do as well, indicate, for example, public transit ridership has suffered declines in ridership of anywhere between like 40 to 90%. And this is a global phenomenon. And I think one of the big questions of the day, one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, and I'm sure you have as well, is you know, what do we do about rebuilding trust in our public transportation system? And I go so far as to say that that also includes not just public transit, but the shared mobility ecosystem. And I think this is, is a big question where there's a massive question mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's two sides, right? There's the supply side and the demand exactly. side. Exactly. That so, was the next question, in fact. Was this yeah, yeah, you know, so how do we how do we supply it safely? And mm -hmm. and then on the demand side, how do we get people feeling comfortable with it? And so it's like it's very complicated because it's a, it's not one dimension like how do I feel safe getting in my private car and, and driving on the road, right? It's mm -hmm. How do I su supply a service safely, including protecting the drivers of these systems, right? And then how do I ensure that the passenger feels safe coming back? And I think 
you know, when we look to Asia, there's been some, some interesting experiences with other pandemics when we look abroad. And, and I think confidence building has been something that some Asian cities have been really good at, um, like Taipei, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and yeah. I think getting people to wear the masks, getting people to wash their hands, and honoring sort of this social distancing, right, has been really critical to bringing a lot of people in Europe and Asia back to public transit. But we seem to be struggling with this here. Yeah. And so, so, it's tough. So looking at it as, again, recognizing essentially it's a double-sided market, you know, one for drivers and one for riders that the platform is matching. Um, would, you, where, would you say, or do you have any indication of where the fear factor has been greater among riders or among drivers? Yeah. Drivers, of course, have to work at some point, you know, that's source of income and so on. So they're probably more willing to, uh, to, to adjust, I guess, to, to, to uh, continue earning that. But has there been any data on this that you're aware of? Well, you know what? I actually just spoke um, with members of the California Transit Association, mm-hmm. and they're going to be putting out a document very soon mm-hmm. um, that I'm hoping to look at with best practices and, and policy options recommendations for how to proceed. But based on the conversation I just had today, I was, I was amazed at how much it is actually affecting their labor supply. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the issue of safety and hygiene and sanitation, it's also the financial side. Oh. So some people aren't coming back to work and maybe they're not filling those positions. And how do you do planning for how to ramp up when they're, they don't have the staff to do that or the guarantee that they have finances to pay those people. So I think this is a very complex problem Mm -hmm. that unfortunately is not just a wicked problem faced with lots of, um, of dimensions, right? But it's it, the hallmark of it is complete utter uncertainty. <laughs> yep. Uh, so staying with this, I guess, public confidence scale in this current period, where would you say we are um, in most U.S. cities? Uh, if you were to score it somewhere between zero, which is total fear, a <laughs> hundred, which is what we were pre-COVID, uh, what would where would you say we are? Say for TNC versus transit. TNC versus transit. Oh, wow, I you know I don't have any empirical data to support it, so all I can do is try to kind of tell you what what I'm I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. It, you know, in, in different sectors is that I think, you know, public transit's done a lot to try to help bring its ridership up. And that is definitely showing up in the numbers. Um, and that can be by offering free service. Um, in some cases, you have to have free, free service by offering backdoor entry into the bus. And so that's, that's helping um, the social distancing and the fact that um, there isn't as, demand, as much demand for public transit, but in, in the TNC area, um, I think, you know, there's even cities like New York City that are ban- banning the pooling option. So what kind of feedback effect might that have on confidence in getting into a single TNC ride is a question that I have. Mm-hmm. And from a policymaking standpoint, you know, why say it's okay to get on public transit, but not get into a shared vehicle. Like what's, what's the difference? So, so for me, I think um, there's conflicting signals mm-hmm. um, that I, I would imagine are affecting trust on both sides. But in terms of the data, it looks like transit is, is getting a bump, not a great bump but it's it's moving and i would assume the tnc marketplace is as well well then should, I, I'll go, yeah, sorry, yeah go ahead no you go ahead oh one thing i wanted to tell you that i, I think is quite fascinating um is the tncs i saw the other day were offering a pickup point for drivers to pick up free ppe mm-hmm. and i think that would help on the labor side, making them feel more supported. And I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Yeah. 
Well, in, in Chicago, in, in the, there's a, in terms of transit ridership, uh, there are several bus lines where, it, in fact, there is, has been um, increased, right, not, not relative to pre-COVID, but in terms of picking up, mostly be, of, uh, because of essential workers. I mean, these are neighborhoods that are very much transit or dependent in many ways, and there's a lot of essential workers, and that's really their main form of transportation. And so there's been, uh, I mean, that's, that's been an encouraging, I guess, sign that, that we've had there. But you're right, the many transit agencies have really try to convey that they are um, cleaning, disinfecting, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, but there's always that, I mean, that notion is, do you go with one person who's the driver, but closer, versus do you go in a larger vehicle with a few other people, but it's larger. And so uh, there's kind of uh, yeah. exposure versus distance. Uh, so there's, uh, and I think, honey, another thing that's going to be really fascinating to track is the ebbs and flow of this virus. Exactly. and how that affects trust. Absolutely, absolutely. So you mentioned, you alluded to that earlier, but are you aware of consumer confidence tracking for ride hailing and other shared mobility services, like in a formal way? I mean, we see a lot of cell phone data and so on, but I'm not seeing anybody who's reporting uh, kind of uh, regularly a confidence uh, number. There may have been a sort of one of the management consultants, McKinsey or someone that has tracked that. Are, are you aware of that? I have not seen anything like that, but I think one thing I will tell you that I spent a lot of time researching and thinking about was the trust system. Mm -hmm. Because as you mentioned, Ray, I've been looking at all forms of shared mobility for a while. And so um, back many decades ago or two de over two decades ago i was working on carpooling mm -hmm. and i think one of the the biggest issues there was gaining trust in getting on a car with a stranger mm -hmm. and so when uber and lyft came about i was just completely fascinated by what they were doing to address this issue right and and what was developed ultimately was that far five-star rating system mm -hmm. and that has been very, very crucial, I think, in, in increasing trust. And I've wondered, could we do something like that, mm -hmm. almost crowdsource it across modes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that would be very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. alluded to some of the things going on outside of the US, uh, and you're right, many places around the world, in Asia and Europe, a started reopening ahead of the U.S. as the disease spread there was controlled. Uh, and um, so are there any best practices or insights that you could uh, share with us in terms of emerging trends and lessons learned? Yeah, well, one thing that I've been really fascinated by in um, Asia is the movement to look at more digitization of tracking the virus and, and hence building consumer confidence mm -hmm. by using it to, to help you know um, about the availability of, of, a, of a ride service or a bus, um, given that there may be social distancing practices and limiting the, the, the number, so the frequency. Um, also, maybe just even passively taking your temperature. Mm -hmm. And I know that this maybe gets into privacy and Big Brother, but you know what role could technology play in helping to overcome some of these barriers through like just even contactless, um, you know, seamless routing, booking payment, right? And just using the app so that you don't even need to touch anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there's developments going on in places like Hong Kong that I've been tracking. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Taiwan as well is doing quite a lot of work in this. And I know, again, it, it, it crosses into areas around privacy, but what role could, could, could technology play in helping us control and manage the virus? Yeah. So as part of one, you know, this is kind of tangential to this and not directly a question, but one of the I, ideas that I had pitched to a couple of agencies was let's have an independent entity that goes around and is actually sampling different touch, you know, commonly touched areas and so on, and sampling for existence of the virus. Uh, yeah. This may be on, on vehicles, this may be in stations and so on. And, uh, you know, let 
an you know university or a firm or whatever, just go in and just randomly do that on a regular basis and report those numbers. And that would show, look, you know, this is as clean as your house or, or whatever. A um, lot of pushback <laughs> on that. That is not something that that's at too well with, with agencies. Of course, there's a lot of issues they're dealing with, but uh, that sort of the whole notion of an independent kind of assessment of that. Mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. the, uh, um, so I don't know if anybody's doing that, actually. I don't, I don't, are you aware of anyone that's kind of independently monitoring the existence of the virus uh, in the system? I'm not aware of anybody doing that, but today I did hear something about an interest in testing for the virus in inside indoor settings. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. For school, and certainly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that has actually come up quite a bit in the context of UC Berkeley and reopening and its labs is just thinking about the ventilation system and how long this airborne virus can stay present. Mm -hmm. And so that type of testing, that objective data seems really helpful in building confidence in reopening schools as well as, as you know, large scale um, transportation systems. Okay, so um, while demand for individual rides has dropped during the crisis, the demand for e-deliveries has gone through the roof, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> including demand for food and restaurant deliveries. Those guys are doing great. How much substitution do you think there is between the driver pools of ride hailing and those doing deliveries? Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually doing a COVID style um, tracking study, you probably are doing similar types of things where I'm trying to get from the user side, mm -hmm. um, how much they're substituting e-commerce e and, and deliveries yep. mm -hmm. for the trips that they would have taken. Um, so stay tuned on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that from my analysis of what the markets are doing or on the supply side is there has been a big pivot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of question marks around whether or not these delivery services are a sustainable business model as well, particularly when they're interfacing with restaurants. I think mm -hmm. there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not that's a good symbiotic relationship for the restaurateur um, as well as the driver. But there has definitely been a pivot in the marketplace towards expanding that. And I think some of the big winners in this, and I know this might be controversial, mm -hmm. are, are companies like Amazon. Mm -hmm. So with, of course they are, I mean, that's clear. I mean, all you have to see is, yeah, the, their, their uh, earning re earnings re reports and so on. So, yeah. okay. So with people living more sort of local neighborhood oriented lives, have micro mobility alternatives, such as bike sharing, e-scooters, et cetera, become more significant? And really, where do you see the future for micromobility? Are we past the novelty of e-scooters and the annoyance, perhaps, of e-scooters? <laughs> uh, or will this become a significant form of urban mobility post-COVID? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the you know, exciting developments, right? Is we've witnessed this uptake of bikes, and not necessarily shared bikes, but the bike industry. Right. electric bikes and in cities creating new curb management policies almost overnight to accommodate them. And this is happening globally, as you know, you know, um, a lot of cities are looking at, at doing this and have done it like London and Madrid and, um, and uh, many cities in the U S. And so I think that this trend could be with us for a long time. When I think about it, I don't think about it necessarily as a shared phenomenon, but just mm -hmm. a larger phenomenon of active transportation. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the shared micromobility companies, um, you know, a lot of them have been deemed an essential worker business. Um, we've seen in some cities, when you look from a year ago, a doubling or more of the ridership in a bike sharing system. Right. Some. And in some cases, we did see cities actually pull the, the devices back. And I think that was more in the early days of COVID when we didn't understand exactly how the transmission occurred nearly as well. Mm 
But I think this is a really fascinating and interesting space to watch because it's like a renaissance in, you know, public health. Mm -hmm. So do you see this tying in also with the whole sort of reclaiming the public space uh, kind of movement at this point? Yeah, I think this is very, very much a, a moment in time. And I think the question I have is, is this a movement, you know, mm -hmm. and and how much is this going to stick? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so Susan, you, you were, as far as I know, the very first person in the U.S. to study shared vehicle fleets long before Zipcar, I go, et cetera. Uh, yeah. You were still a student, if I recall. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you were uh, already, I guess, doing the first demonstration project uh, on that. And, um, you know, with people still skittish about writing with others, do you see a, resurs a resurgence, perhaps, of interest in, in the demand for these services? Yeah, I, I've been looking pretty closely at the car sharing market. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I have been seeing is, well, let me step back for a second, just because um, I think you're pretty well versed in the models of, of car sharing, but there's two that I really want to focus on, right? And it's, it's essentially this round trip model where you go into and out of the same location. And then you have more of a peer to peer model where people are putting their own personal vehicles in. Um, and what I think had happened is car sharing was essentially the first shared mode. You know, some might argue it was, it was bike sharing, but I think in terms of global uptake in this notion, it really was car sharing and car sharing after around 2010, really started to evolve into these different models, like a one-way service, mm -hmm. as well as P2P. Mm -hmm. But what we started to see is some declines in its numbers. And some of that was just basic consolidation in the marketplace, which it was really time for that to occur if you look at other business models. Mm -hmm. But I think the advent of all of these other shared modes was complementing, but in some ways competing with it. And so at this moment in time, it's like car sharing in a business to consumer setting, as well as a peer to peer setting could give people more confidence if they can clean the car themselves. Most of the cars have um, some type of hygiene products in it for cleaning and, and know that, you know, I'm not sharing this with another person or five other people, but I'm cleaning it myself and, and I have some degree of control over it if it's a peer-to-peer -peer based model or a business consumer. And what we started to see is that longer term rentals are starting to become quite popular. And that is not something if you and I were talking pre-COVID that I would be saying would have been a likely trajectory for the car sharing market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. P2Ps, the reason I bring this up is P2Bs tended to have more of a longer term rental associated with them than say like a zip car or any kind of a one-way system. But that this is one thing that we're starting to see is I can't afford a car anymore because I'm not working, but I do need access to one maybe what I'll do is rent this particular car sharing vehicle for a longer period of time, not just for say that one hour trip. And then I also know about its hygiene and sanitation. Exactly. It's fascinating. Yeah, that may also have uh, some interesting insights for sort of future autonomous vehicle uh, sort of sharing models as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I think a lot of it comes down to the trust of the, the traveler in, mm -hmm. you know, how safe are they? And um, in, the, in a case of like a, a business to consumer model, there, there aren't as many moving parts as you have in something like a transportation network company where you've got the driver and the rider or multiple riders. So you're able to sort of lock down on the number of variables. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing, I guess, any innovation on the horizon uh, in terms of shared mobility and micro mobility? Um, you know, is there sort of a new dis disruptor on the horizon that's going to come and change uh, things like, uh, you know, the TNCs came and, and, and disrupted, I guess. Um, and would 
such innovation have been accelerated or maybe slowed down by the health crisis? Yeah, I mean, I think we've already talked a bit about the movement of the transportation network company drivers into something more like a courier service. And I think this particular crisis is reinforcing that. Again, I'm not quite sure about the business models based on my read of how this is working out for the types of delivery services they're, they're doing. One of the things that I, I found fascinating initially was um, the Mayo Clinic um, pivot on their shared automated vehicle to, to shift away from delivering passengers, but to delivering um, PPE and tests. And um, I think that's a kind of a fascinating pivot too, is, is what role can automation and, and drones and robotics play in reducing the amount of contact that happens? Uh, and, and does it shift a bit towards delivery? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the big question, uh, are TNCs and conventional public transit friends or foes? Um, <laughs> in some countries, especially in Europe, public agencies have put themselves clearly as the mobility as a service providers. But in the US, it's really been more the TNCs that have you know, positioned their apps, their platforms as being the multimodal kind of uh, mo mobility uh, as a service tool. So what is your take on the current situation and how do you see it evolving? And that's not really a COVID question. That's just- Yeah, uh, yeah, I, no, I love this. I love this topic because it does give us a break from COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we need that. Uh, mobility as a service, right? Like I've been examining this pretty closely too. I see like kind of three types of mobility as a service markets, right? And one is very much vertical integration where, you know, I've got all the services come to my app and everything will be seamless. And, and that's been a more popularized form of mobility as service in this country, right? And that's where I think you can potentially get into these competitions for the customer in a way that may or may not fully integrate a public transit operator. And then you have sort of a hybrid mobility as a service marketplace where you see the public transit operator on a platform and a platform that's a little bit more diverse than a monopolistic um, approach. And then you see in Europe, there's several examples of a fully public transit mobility as a service dominated approach. And you know, I think the US, honey, tends to lean towards more of a private sector approach to this. But we also, I think in this country, haven't supported public transit in the same way that European cities have. So in some ways, is it, is it the result of, 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 um, of capitalism or is it the result of policymakers? Well, it's not clear which outcome ultimately, you know, which, yeah. how the consumer benefits best at this point. I think the verdict may still be out on that. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I think one of the big questions we have this moment with a crisis mm -hmm. to really examine is what is the role of public transport? What is the role of the social good and the government? And is there a way for us to create a super complementary utopian future between public and private. You know, that's what I would love to see. But I think we've struggled with that here um, more than the European model has. Indeed. Um, okay, well, Susan, this, this has been uh, very informative and insightful, thank you. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for us? Yeah, there's one thing I wanna talk about and that is how important it is that we think about social equity as we move forward, you know, with COVID, I think we have really, the, the exposure of the inequities in our systems has been so profound. And I've been a long time supporter of social equity, particularly in shared mobility. And, and I really just hope we can take this moment to, to advance this and to make sure when we're de developing AI technologies, which I know you do, that 
we're thinking about unintended consequences and, and really trying to build a system for everybody and not leave anybody behind, regardless of gender, race, uh, physical ability, and cultural factors. Awesome. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. Appreciate your comments and appreciate your participating with us today. Wish you all the My best. My pleasure, honey. Okay, um, at this point, uh, we go live. Uh, thank you to uh, all of those who have uh, stayed with us uh, through the interviews and uh, thank you to our panelists who are joining us uh, one by one. Um, and we'll be uh, here to uh, take your questions. Um, I know we have re received um, several um, really good and uh, probing questions. Um, our senior associate director, Brett Johnson, uh, will be the one uh, asking the questions. Uh, he has been mon monitoring the uh, question line. So uh, first, let me welcome um, you all again, uh, Sharon, Shinpei, uh, and Susan. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, yeah. I, uh, I just want to say hi to Susan and Shinpei too. <laughs> Great. Um, so, um, Brad, do you want to go ahead and uh, start with the uh, first um, question that you've selected? Yeah, so here we go. So thanks, for everybody, for joining us today. Um, we're going to start off this first question to Susan, uh, but then we'll ask Shinpei and Sharon to answer it as well. <clears throat> so here's the first question. Uh, if conflicting signals are causing confusion, impacting confidence, what mechanisms can be used to minimize these conflicting signals? Wow, I think the first thing I would say is a more consistent policy, right? Um, that was something that Shin Pei talked a lot about in, during her interview, was that in Asia we, we saw and ha saw through the SARS uh, pandemic, but, but also as we've moved into COVID-19, I think a more clear, consistent policy. You know, I think the simple things, honestly, Brett, would, would, would help us go a long way towards building up confidence if people could trust that other people are gonna wear masks and properly social distance. I know that may not be the um, sexy technological answer you're looking for, but, or someone might be looking for, but I think, I think if we could get on the same page in terms of practice, um, simple practices, I think that would go a long way towards building confidence. Shinpei, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think, I think the thing that really um, stood out for me about other regions is their consistent communication. They didn't, they embraced the accountability and the responsibility of letting people know what they should be doing. And, and then they really didn't back away from that. And even to this day, I think my sister lives in Australia. So I was hearing about this. Um, every day they actually mourn the people that are passed, you know, pass away through COVID, but it's three people, two people, and they take time to recognize that. And I think that kind of transparency really helps in this situation. Sharon? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would echo that in terms of consistency. I think, though, when we look at public transit in particular, where there's been so much um, loss of uh, confidence in it, we also have to consider that we started out telling people not to use transit. And, um, you know, some of it is just how we've communicated. So, the getting on top of it and uh, making sure that people have masks, that the cleaning is occurring. And, you know, as we're starting to see some studies come out, it's not linking to, um, to transit. So, um, and if you think about the communications that the airlines have done for themselves, while they haven't built back a lot of confidence, they've had a kind of consistent message about what they're doing and how they're handling it. And we've been um, a little unclear on that at the same time that we have a lot of people who have to use transit and then, um, and so are using transit and some of the loss of transit use 
is also because we've cut back on the service that's provided. And when you have essential workers needing to get to work, they still need the frequency of the schedules. Thank you. Brett, you want to go to your next uh, question? Sharon, let's stick with you and we'll go in reverse order. <laughs> Will autonomous vehicles and transit systems be perceived as safer? Um, will they be perceived as safer because of COVID? Or I think, I think that's the question is, are they safer considering the health environment that we're in? Um, so I think that um, autonomous vehicles, um, you know, have not come about as quickly as some of us thought. Um, in fact, this morning I was uh, participating in a discussion about autonomous vehicles and one of the participants showed a list of all the companies that were supposed to be operating uh, by this year, in fact. And, um, you know, and like none of them have uh, consumer products at this point. So it's taken longer. I think that um, there is a lot of investment in the delivery side and there is, a, um, I think that smaller vehicles that seem easier to manage and clean and you have a little more control are perhaps more popular now uh, than transit. Um, but I think it's a matter of getting consistent, you know, following the science and doing it uh, in these, these different modes, if we can figure out the business models, uh, can all thrive ultimately. Shinpei, what do you think about autonomous vehicles? Um, I think it's, you know, I, um, I think there's a lot of hype, honestly. I think there's been some advances. Um, I think that what will make them actually work is when the policy structure is in place. Yeah. And that actually is the place where innovation, more innovation needs to be exerted. Um, it's a really challenging thing because I think the actual technology development um, is it can appear straightforward, but it's the human interactions and kind of the governance of these spaces that complicate it. So in safer in a very conceptual way, but I don't think we're even close to being there when I think about the next 18 months of living with COVID. Susan, you gave an example of what the Mayo Clinic was doing. Uh, I believe it was in Jacksonville. Right, right. So I think that was an interesting example for us to look at where there were shared automated vehicles in practice to help shuttle people around. And with COVID, less demand for, for shuttling people around and more demand for getting PPE and test supplies out there. So they pivoted towards use of the SAV or shared automated vehicle towards uh, deliveries. And so I think that contactless element is, is an interesting one for robotics. I do agree with Sharon and Shin Pei regarding, I think the complexity of integrating shared automated vehicles, particular, particularly into mixed use environments and mixed traffic where there's automated vehicles and non-automated vehicles and pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, this is gonna take a long time and uh, I, I'm not sure it's gonna happen within the time frame of, of this virus. At least I hope not, because I hope we're through this virus in at least a couple years. Yeah, I do think though that the, um, the use of the streets as we develop and in the places where we are making streets more um, available to pedestrians and putting restaurants out in the middle of them and using them in different ways also provides an opportunity to create more safe uh, lanes for things like an automated delivery service, just as it could for um, an automated shuttle or, or uh, you know, mm. bus rapid transit. Yeah, like setting the, setting the stage for the curbside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that possibility uh, exists now. It's um, not going to be everywhere that 
takes advantage of it. I think in some European cities, though, there is really a strong push um, to change the way the streets are used. Well, full disclosure, we're looking at a scenario through simulation at this point where you can take in an area or a zone, let's mm -hmm. say that has high COVID risk and you only allow autonomous vehicles in there to essentially be moving people. And, uh, you know, there, there, there could be some interesting potential. Again, hopefully we won't get to that, but, but as a extreme scenario, I think there, there is, uh, um, you know, there, there's probably value in, in looking at these uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And tying them in with mobility hubs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So your responses to that question, I want to thank Raymond Hall for that last question. And I want to thank Ron uh, Borneau for the first question. Uh, so moving on to a third question, we have a, uh, a question from Maya and she asked, and we'll start this one with Shinpei and uh, then we'll figure out an order after that. But the question is, most of the shared mobility services are easier to access and use in affluent or more white neighborhoods. What, if any, steps are shared mobility providers taking to enable easier access to transportation modes and delivery services in poor neighborhoods, which often tend to be food deserts as well? Yeah, such a good question and very relevant right now. Um, I think, um, I've known Sharon and Susan for years before joining Uber, and I think we all share this interest in increasing access, being inclusive, um, making sure that transportation is available um, no matter where you live. And we, especially in the United States, uh, have to contend with a land use pattern that's quite challenging for conventional transportation planning. So I, I do think there's a huge role for on-demand shared um, transportation, especially as we move into a um, city living with COVID that's polycentric and neighborhoods and maybe cities always were polycentric, but we didn't have that inclusive lens in which we were looking at the way that cities are organized and, the com and what communities needed, honestly. Um, so some of the things that um, I think could really um, work well, I mean, there's been studies done about TNCs being able to provide um, a taxi-like service to neighborhoods that generally would never have taxis um, going there. We do not reveal, um, um, you know, just to, you know, drive down any kind of discrimination, destination discrimination, um, profiling discrimination. We don't reveal details of that ride when the driver picks up. Um, we really try to monitor what's going on on the platform in terms of our service quality. Um, and it's imperfect. Um, we can't control people's behaviors, but we can try to have strong responses when there isn't, um, you know, positive behavior. I think there's also interesting things to be done around and ensuring there's um, transportation service that overcomes barriers. So trying to concentrate um, service in neighborhoods that might not have a big transit hub, for example, or maybe um, working with a city to identify neighborhoods that have um, infrequent or low volume um, and might be expensive for the city to be providing transit right now. Like we, I think those are opportunities where we would like to step in. And in fact, those are the conversations that we're having right now with many transit agencies. Um, I think with micromobility too, there's an opportunity to provide that service so long as the city is also willing to put in the infrastructure. I find it really troubling sometimes when I hear about some of the equity requirements around micromobility without the kind of commensurate infrastructure investment on the part of the city. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging situation, but you know, it's an ongoing is an ongoing challenge and hopefully one that we're striving to overcome. Um, yeah, I think the, um, the infrastructure to ensure safety uh, is really important to the spread of micro mobility. Um, I do think that um, on the micro mobility side, on the bike share, scooter share, um, there has been um, some places that have done a pretty good job of spreading 
those services and some of them are just starting to like Chicago where we are or where some of us are um, it just um, uh, launched the e-bike share uh, program starting with the far south side and spreading it to every neighborhood in Chicago and the scooter pilot is going to launch again and be um, uh, covered the whole city as well so I think policy has helped on that too, that, you know, uh, requiring companies, if you're gonna be in one location, you also have to be in uh, multiple places and then setting up um, good uh, fee structures that can also make, make these programs more available. So those are other things that can be done, but, but we do have to sort of in a fundamental way, look at, where the jobs are and where people live and uh, really address that because that's so basic, but a lot of um, uh, systems are not actually built to, to help. Now that there's all this focus on essential workers, a lot of those jobs are not in downtowns. They're all around and um, the routing is not uh, solid for that. And it, it, it is an opportunity with on-demand services uh, and more flexible services sometimes to, to do better on that. Susan? Oh, I just wanted to thank Sharon for mentioning the disconnect or the spatial mismatch um, when we look at uh, low-income individuals and, uh, and the lack of affordable housing near jobs. And so I, I also have a lot of hope in on-demand mobility helping to solve some of these problems, but I fear we're not gonna be able to do that without some serious uh, thought about how we're gonna finance and, and support on-demand services. Because as all of you guys know on the phone, right, or on the Zoom call know, it's, um, it's really hard to cover the transportation costs of anything. Yeah. And there's a lot of hidden subsidies for things like private cars um, that don't get called out enough. And so, you know, the thing I think we've got to really roll up our sleeves and work on is if we're going to really try to create equitable transportation services, how are we going to help pay for them? And how are we going to create an environment that the private sector and the public sector can work together on in a complementary way? It's mm. a good segue into your next question, Brett, I think. <laughs> um, we'll start with Sharon. Uh, Jill Howe asks, <clears throat> the panelists commented on upticks in driving, uh, but they but do you have any thoughts on the delivery component versus the mobility component? Um, well, the uptick that's occurred, um, there's been an uptick in car driving. So car, auto use has returned more quickly than transit use. One of the things though that is interesting is the transit systems that really have more uh, dependent riders. Some of those, their um, use, utilization rates have stayed pretty high. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, Dayton, Ohio. Um, and then in Chicago, I think Honey mentioned this earlier about like on the south and west sides of Chicago, the utilization rates have stayed quite high. And Chicago is one of the few transit agencies that has maintained its service levels um, throughout the pandemic and really took it on to say, well, that'll help us social distance because we'll just keep running the full service. And in fact, adding trains even um, when things have, uh, have gotten more crowded. So I don't know that that answered your question, but, but um, I haven't seen data that distinguish between say private vehicle VMT from e-commerce related mm -hmm. uh, delivery VMT. But I do think we have to be cautious of data that are coming from apps because apps are reflecting the users that are on those apps. So there's a bias in the data there. And some may be searches as opposed to actual trips. So some of those data that are coming out, we should be careful about interpreting those as all trips um, 
and 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 they're they're also reflecting the bias of the apps themselves. Yeah. Good point. There's clearly been a lot of increase in delivery services. I mean, that's you know, but yeah. But what we know sure, from the operations side is the logistics side tends to be able to manage its VMT a little bit better and, and more efficiently. Mm. So so I'm I'm somewhat because I I'm familiar with good movement data. Um, dubious that you know it's it's out of control vmt from delivery because those are businesses and they they run really tight i see honey shaking his head so but but i haven't seen data that disaggregates the the vmt yeah yeah no that's i mean yeah they're more efficient except when you or you have an order of five items and they come in five different trips <laughs> indeed <laughs> Right, but some of them don't, you know, so there is a little bit of that where you you yeah. get a, a multiple orders and they actually show up in one bundle. Yeah. Uh, but clearly that's not a universal thing, but that is something that policy and technology can uh, do more of. Oh, just what I was going to say, just really quickly, honey, is just like the substitution effect. Mm -hmm. You know, so while we're in shelter in place, or we're supposed to be sheltering in place more, um, you know, how how are we shifting our our need for travel to to things like e-commerce? I think I think that's quite fascinating, and and will mm -hmm. that will that pattern last post COVID, or do we all just go back? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Shinpei, any comments on the, uh, I guess, the, the question, the delivery? Uh, yeah, I... Distinguishing, I, I guess, the, the VMT, et cetera. Do you have I any data? Haven't <laughs> data that, I haven't seen data that disaggregates VMT. I agree that in general, there's greater um, efficiency from logistic companies. Um, and, and honestly, when, I think when I was speaking to it, I was really looking, you know, speaking to it as a trend line, not, you know, truth as much as you know these kinds of data sets can be truth um, but i think there's the general trend line which i think you can't really dispute which is that driving is is growing much faster than anything else yeah so brett can, if we, can we stay with the with the delivery uh, uh theme here because i know you had a question from maya as well on that yeah, let me go find that one question one from maya if you could i think that would be a good uh Continuation. All righty, here we go. Again, from my, as Hani mentions, um, most delivery services in the U.S. are limited to food and now some groceries. Uh, do any of you see a future where delivery services are greatly expanded in U.S. cities? Uh, that's the question. There's a for an, an example as well, but I'll leave it there. Um, seems like a lot of things get delivered beyond credit that they come. I get many things delivered. I'm not sure what this is. What was what was the example? Okay, so the example was, for example, uh, I was recently talking to a friend, not myself, but Maya, uh, who had returned <laughs> from India, who said that it is very common to buy clothes from a store online and have them delivered home. Uh, the driver who brings the clothes will actually wait while you try them on and immediately take back anything you don't want. So that is a different, you know, a, a different story than what we're experiencing here right now. In other words, service that with idea. the yeah, right. I can totally see that happening here. Um, I mean, maybe it's, you know, if, if the question is about how ubiquitous it will be, I think there will be, you know, different, a whole range of different services that results from the need to shelter in place, from the need to maintain some local economic activity to um, support small businesses that are in these in cities and not to, you know, I, the, I'm really worried about small businesses. Mm. Um, and that's, that sounds actually like quite a great service. There's probably a premium for it. So it's not that everyone can afford something like that, but it sounds perfect for this situation where people still want to, you know, let's say shop or browse, and this is like a permutation of it. Um, interestingly, just on the delivery side, one thing that we saw is that there were more customers of Uber Eats in 
South Bronx and East Queens and uh, East Brooklyn than there were in Manhattan um, in the early weeks of COVID. So I think, I, I think that we also tend to rely too much on demographic preference kind of, you know, um, correlations and, you know, should give people a chance to actually signal what they're, what they need and what they look for. Um, I, you know, everyone, I think that there is this um, result of people being able to expand their customer reach. And it's not, it's not universal. There's going to be some business that aren't able to do that, but many do. And um, even I would, I think there was a study that we did recently that showed that the majority of restaurants on Uber Eats um, were very, were benefiting from being there, especially in the weeks um, after shelter in place. So, you know, there's always the outliers, but you know, what is, what is the majority benefit that can be gotten from new delivery models? Okay, Sharon, do you want to add to that or? I do, I just. <laughs> Had a little uh, dog interruption. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> quietly. It, it, it wouldn't be a Zoom call without a dog interruption. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody else came home, apparently. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, about uh, what <laughs> can you tell me the question again? <laughs> Delivery. That was the, the, the delivery services beyond, I guess, what we see today. Oh, right? yeah. No, I think a, they... Kind of a Postmates with, with service. Yeah. And I think absolutely that's happening. And I think that's happening in different ways. I mean, I'm not going to go into all my purchasing, but I had a local store deliver a number of items that, and then I picked out what I wanted and they took back the other stuff. I mean, that... I think uh, that kind of thing definitely can and will develop. And the delivery, the investment that's gone into the delivery business uh, just since COVID is quite um, substantial. And um, I think that uh, that's an area to stay. And I think it also, the automated side will uh, be part of it in different ways, whether it's the robots or the uh, vehicles, um, the cargo bikes. Um, there are just a lot, a variety of modes that can be part of the delivery um, package. Yeah, Susan. And and I think that also leads to the whole, like the you know we were talking about mobility hubs and lockers and all this way of um, you know large vehicles bringing certain things to. Uh, a, a region and then breaking it down and moving it in smaller chunks. Susan? Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for delivery of medical related um, items like uh, prescriptions or supplies. You know, we have so many people who are sheltering in place because their um, immune systems are compromised. And some some of the studies I've looked at suggest that you know, these people may be sheltering in place for a very long time, even beyond the vaccine. So um, how can we get them their, their medical um, items, but, but also their food and, and other, other types of things? So I think we may see some things um, shift and stick. Okay, great. All right, Brett, you want to pick a good one? Yeah, uh, speaking of uh, shifting and, and sticking, I, there was... <laughs> here I'm trying to find it now um, <clears throat> which talks about uh, telework so with a strong presence of telework for many workers will this stick whereby the density of urban centers will change real estate values may decrease and neighborhoods uh, have a renewed focus for economic vitality that's what do you think about the stickiness of telework and I don't know impacts I know what honey thinks <laughs> Um, I think it's definitely going to stick. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not, it's not going to become a hundred percent, but I think places that can do it are going to do it half time if they don't do it all the time. I mean, I think it's going to shave the peak off of 
commu the commute patterns in a lot of places. Because so it why hasn't it happened they, before? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why hasn't it happened before? There were many opportunities for that to happen. But I think we weren't on Zoom before, <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of ways that, you know, we still call it telework, mm -hmm. but it's not telework exactly. It's, um, I mean, we can, we can share information in a lot of different ways. And, and if this speed gets shaved, there will be another one uh, in, in another year. So you don't think it's gonna, your thought is that this is all gonna go away and everyone's- Not all, I think in some instances, in, in part, it will be there, but I do not think it's as big of a replacement uh, at least given, you know, the historical experience, but you're the guest, I'm, I'm, I'm the mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's interesting because I find, uh, you know, just with my own staff and talking to, I meet every week with um, a lot of other uh, nonprofit uh, executive mm -hmm. directors and basically nobody on those staffs wants to go back to their offices. I mean, they want to get together, you know, they want to have meetings, mm -hmm. they want to meet sometimes, but um, yeah, I just think- we'll, 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 we'll see. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I think it's because there's such a body of academic work on this, Sharon, that, yeah. that makes us, I think, cautious. You know, I remain cautiously optimistic on this, mm -hmm. and I hear a lot of the same things you do. But I also have heard about the tech industry, you know, issuing telecommute policies in the past and then pulling back on it because they feel that they're not getting the, the innovation moments, right, that happen in the hallways. I don't yeah. know, what's going on with Uber, Shinpei? <laughs> um, well, I th we probably will be in this situation for a while, but mostly out of safety precaution. Um, but honestly, that's a U.S. situation in Europe, even in New York. Um, out maybe in New York is not large because they have contained the or have more controls in place. Um, we're actually probably going to be letting people go back soon. Something that I think kind of puts me in, in the middle around this issue is that childcare um, in that dependency is very, very challenging for people who can work from home. So um, I think that we, there's, there's like a, other, other factors in place that will probably like a good portion of people will continue to work from home, but a good portion will want to be in the office because there's other pieces that are not going to be um, back uh, to normal anytime soon. Hmm. How do you train new workers? We've had people start within the last mm -hmm. three months. Uh, yeah. Of course, it is very challenging. Um, you do what you can. I exactly. mean, mm -hmm. you it's, know, it, it's, less it's than not the ideal. same as meeting people in person. I'm relatively new to the company myself. I feel like it's not the same as being with people, but um, you know, everyone's in the same situation. <laughs> All right, um, perhaps our last question. Uh, yes, yeah, so many good questions, Hani. Um, like you had a good one, I think, that kind of integrates things. Uh, that was the third question during Sharon's uh, interview from the gentleman in Brazil. Yeah, we can go back to that one. That's a good question. Um, sorry for the questions we haven't, we haven't been able to get to. Really a great set of questions today. Uh, so Rafael Sicuria, uh, who is Brazilian, he asks, uh, how can the cities organize shared mobility modes in a single and comprehensive transportation policy? Um, are there good examples of regulation of uh, TNC modes in other cities? Who wants to who wants take to start? Yeah. Yeah. Sharon? Sharon, you're on mute. It's on mute. You're on mute, Sharon. Sorry. Okay, there we go. I, it wouldn't click. Um, so I think that, well, I think um, Susan brought up 
some of the different options? You know, how do we organize it all together? I think the important, you know, that there are different models for this. So there's the integrated model, the private company, Uber, the Uber app has, uh, you know, whatever companies Uber has relationships with. And, and in Denver, uh, the Denver Public Transit is also on that. So that's like an example of one way to integrate it. Another way to integrate it is an, a third party private company app like Transit App, and they go out and, um, you know, form these relationships and they try and bring in a lot of different companies. Um, but another model is where the, uh, the public sector is more in charge of it. So I think the way to, I think it's important that the public interest is, um, is protected. I think it's important that there are a variety of companies and I think it's fine that individual companies will have their own thing. I wouldn't say we should stop that in any way, but I think that um, the opportunity for the consumer is when it's all connected together and that's when you can also integrate the fair payment and the information about the services. And so then you can get more to the mobility as a service where you're actually bundling things together or from a public sector side, you're able to, um, you know, help manage congestion and improve accessibility by shifting people or suggesting shifts to different modes because there's, you know, a crisis or there's um, a stoppage or whatever it is. So um, I think, I think that's a desirable mode. That doesn't mean, I think it will be public and private, and but it needs to be managed in a way that everybody's feeding into the same system and that you can actually get to the part where you're, um, you're also integrating the fares. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shinpei. You wanna give this um, to yeah, this is a this is a really good question, and I agree about maximizing public benefit. Um, absolutely, I think that what's been interesting to me as I, um, you know, I've been asked this question many times is that we haven't quite figured out the business models, and we haven't quite figured out the policies, and where and where where is the optimal point of integration? Mm. Um, an example is. For uh, an example of that tension is that on the one hand, cities want to maximize public benefit. They want to provide the, the best experience for users so that they can feel that, you know, not taking their car is a reliable choice. Um, so uh, in, that, in that scenario, then operators are essentially competing on providing the best experience. Um, on the other hand, integrating everything onto one place ends up commoditizing that service and you lose the ability to differentiate yourself and provide, you know, and compete on experience. Um, you're not seeing this happen in Europe because there's a lot of experience with outsourcing, contracting out, with using private operators, and in fact, in some cases, even creating performance metrics so that private operators compete to provide that ultimate outcome. We don't really see that here. And we have lopsided subsidies for private car driving, very hidden subsidies. And we then, we end up all the people who care about access, um, care about inclusion and sustainability end up fighting over like a tiny piece of the puzzle when there's like an 80% part of the transportation system. No, no, no. It's been bigger than that. 85. <laughs> 85. I'm being optimistic. Um, but we're, we end up fighting over this tiny piece of the pie and not really tackling the larger piece. Um, you know, and, and that to me is where maybe the private sector in the United States anyway 
has a bit of an edge of thinking about the consumer, creating experiences for the consumer. Um, you know, I just I saw a question I wanted to just ask. For example, we have a partnership with CVS where um, people without bank accounts can upload their Uber account with cash, and this is the this is the United States model. I'm not you know. Other countries don't need to do this because they would not have this situation among their population. We happen to have this situation. And my thing is that I would prefer as we sort this out that no one is waiting for that reliable access to transportation that we can provide access to as many people as possible. Um, and, we, and then we have to work together to figure this out and to work through this tension. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, no one-size-fits-all solution here. Uh, Susan, uh, you want to close this one out? Yeah, well, I, I love ending on um, a note of social equity and social justice. And, and I think these platforms, to bring just the, the thread back to this question, um, they worry me in some ways if they become exclusionary. And they also worry me if... Um, somebody's just on one platform and they want to take a bike but there's no bike out in front of their workplace so then do they take motorized transit instead of taking active transit so i think there's some some issues and concerns i just generally have about the public good and societal interest if we rely on vertical integration alone and i think we should look a lot to what the Europeans are doing in terms of a mass platform that, that is motivated by the public sector and the public good, which creates a, a mobility marketplace for all. Um, I, know, I know that may be tough for the private companies because, because they also have to make money, but I think in terms of emphasizing accessibility, equitable access, um, perhaps a platform that has more um, um, influence from the public sector who manages the rights of way would get us closer to equitable strategies. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a good uh, point, I guess, on which to end. Uh, I want to thank um, all of you uh, for being with us uh, today and also uh, participating in the interviews and for being, you know, candid through all of uh, these, these questions here. Uh, I would like to thank our audience also for sticking with us. Uh, next week, we will have our fifth and last um, AVR in this series. Uh, we're going to be tackling uh, digitalization and technological innovation in urban mobility. Uh, very much building on what we discussed today. And uh, during the fall, uh, we intend to do a series on telemobility. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. And uh, again, all of these are recorded and, and they will be uh, um, available through our, uh, through our website. Uh, we gave you the tiny URL earlier. So uh, hopefully we'll see many of you again next week. Uh, and again, thank you very much to our speakers um, and to you, our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.